In Exodus chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, when Moses, his father-in-law Jethro, to appoint some helpers, he was, he was told to appoint Okay, it looks like had a little technical problem there, but um, Moses was counseled to appoint officers of thousands, officers of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And, and these men were to assist Moses in the work that he was doing. And we can gain some insight here as to the nature of the men that were to be chosen for this responsibility. And let's read the text. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and placing such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee but every small matter they shall judge, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. Notice here that the qualifications mentioned in this passage are th threefold. They were to be able men, The first point perhaps needs the least amount of explanation. Able signifies that they were to doing the work. They were to be they were to be um, qualified in a temporal or physical way. They were to have sufficient discernment, sufficient skill. Their, uh, the way that the mind works and that sort of thing, enough that they could discern right and wrong and and make a proper judgment and so this especially refers to the mental capability and uh, perhaps as well some of the the spiritual capability to discern right and wrong but it doesn't go into too much detail about in what ways they were able but in the next three, it points out some specific qualities of that capability. The first was such as fear God. And, and the fear of God is, is much more perhaps than initially meets the eye. In Matthew 10, 28, Matthew 10, 28, we read, What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. Sorry, this is Psalms 25, first of all. 
So the the one that fears the Lord, first of all, will be teachable. He will be looking to see what God's will is. He will be looking to see what God has said about something. It says, says that way that God would choose. And so he's not, he's not uh, looking for his own way, but looking for God's way. And this was considered the first quality, this first spiritual quality that the person needed to have. In Hebrews 13, 6, we read, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. There's, there's a real danger for the gospel worker constantly um, something that we need to constantly guard against, and that is, is the fear of man. Being afraid of what others will say, being afraid of what others will think, or um, what others will do. Of the worker is to adapt his his message. To, to tickle the ear of his listener rather than to, to speak the truth and what needs to be presented. And typically there is a tendency to please those that have money, those that have influence, those that have power. We don't want to, to arouse their prejudice. We don't want to arouse their, their anger or their displeasure. We want to please them. We want to make them happy. And so there is a natural tendency to, to alter our message and the straightness of the message to please those kinds of people. And, um, and the, the qualities that God mentions here for, for these men in leadership positions are that they will not fear man. They will fear only God. In Hebrews 13, 6, once again, it says that the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now, the next text um, is Matthew 10, 28. And it says specifically, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And that can refer only to God. God is the one that we should fear. God is the one that, that we need to, uh, to please and to, to be sure that, that uh, we are speaking the words that he wants us to speak and not what men want to hear. The next point mentioned in that text was that they were to be men of truth. And we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, 
nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Mentions what can happen if you're not men of truth. It says that, um, that we are to have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Okay, the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. I know that that I've heard people and I've seen this happen where the minister will take a scripture that is not applicable to the situation and yet use it to try to prove his point. A scripture that, that is saying something else entirely. A scripture that that um, perhaps is is um, is well. He uses the scripture in in a way to misrepresent either the truth or or the point, and and there are various reasons why this is done. One of the reasons can be that the the minister is simply not knowledgeable and and he just uses it without really understanding its its import or its application and so it can be just negligence on the part of the minister but um, more often it's done deceitfully because they want to perhaps win the argument or just um, say something in a way that is uh, that they want to say it rather than to say what God wants to say. An example of this is um, Sunday keeping ministers may use Colossians 2.14 to try to say that the law of God, the moral law, is done away with. Or they may um, use texts that, that sound like the second coming of Christ is, is going to be secret. They, they will use a text that says that, that um, it shall come as a thief in the night when if they would read a little closer, a little deeper, they would find that that it only comes as a thief in the night to those that are not watching. It comes as the thief in the night to those that have not uh, studied the signs that Christ has told us about. And and so um, it's he's not going to come in a way that the the secret rapturists teach these are examples of handling the word of god deceitfully another example is those that will take first john 5 7 and twist it to try to make it teach a trinity or matthew 28 19 they will twist to try to make it seem to teach a trinity. Um, this is handling the word of God deceitfully. And, and we may do it simply because, because we um, don't know another text offhand to try to prove what we're trying to say. Or perhaps we've not studied this subject deep enough to, um, to really know. I've heard even people that otherwise had the truth, they will take scriptures and misapply them about a particular passage, perhaps of Galatians 
or of revelation and in other places and some people just like to argue but but god's servants god's true servants will be men of truth then the next and the last point mentioned here in in the the passage of exodus 18 that they will be men that that hate covetousness they hate covetousness covetousness is an evil that stands next to selfishness in its um in its magnitude because it stems directly from selfishness and selfishness lies at the root of every other sin in gospel workers page 141 paragraph 2 we read men of tried courage and strong integrity are needed for this time men who are not afraid to lift their voices for right to every laborer i would say in all your official duties let integrity characterize each act all tithes all monies entrusted to you for any special purpose should be promptly placed where they belong money given for the cause of god should not be appropriated for personal use with the thought that it can be replaced later on. So the qualification that God requires of his servants, that God required of his servants in the days of Moses, and that God requires today, is that his servants are to be men that hate covetousness, men that have integrity, that are honest that you can trust reading on it says this the lord forbids it is a temptation from the one who works evil and evil only the minister who receives funds for the lord's treasury should give the donor a written receipt for the same with the date. Then without waiting to be tempted by financial pressure to use this means for himself, let him deposit it where when called for, it will be forthcoming. Honesty, brothers and sisters, will characterize God's servants. This is a qualification mentioned by the Apostle Paul to Timothy in his second letter, chapter 3, verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Not greedy of filthy lucre. This filthy lucre is a specific negative reference to money not greedy of filthy lucre we have recently in the organizing of of the church here in the philippines the church of believers in the truth about god believers in the 1889 historic message we have have a man that was ordained that was serving as a minister and because someone else a independent ministry was was giving support and promised him a smartphone actually ended up giving him a smartphone promised him a vehicle and seemed to to be more 
um, generous in in their their gifts to him. He changed his loyalty from the service of the church to the service of a independent ministry that um, was working contrary to the church. And, and thus we lost this minister. And I'm thankful that we lost that minister because, uh, because God hates covetousness. If we can be bought and sold for a little more money, for a little more support, we don't deserve the name of gospel worker or minister. God does not want time servers. He does not want in his service men who can be bought and sold, men who, who will sell their souls for the highest bidder. God wants people that are preaching the truth because it is truth that will stand for principle because it is the right thing to do not because someone promises to support them or offers a little more money than someone else in colossians 3 5 and 6 we read, mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Notice that covetousness is is mentioned as one of these earthly members that we must put to death. It's, it's likened to idolatry. And the wrath of God will come upon those that hold on to covetousness. Covetousness is a desire for, for more a desire for money, a desire for riches or for temporal things. We read in, in Luke chapter 12, verses 15 to 18, what Jesus has to say. We're going to uh, back up here to Luke 12, verses 15 to 28. And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, 
what you shall put on. Jesus mentions concerning this individual that just wanted to store and hoard the blessings God had given him. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. God may say that to us, brothers and sisters. How long will those treasures last us? They're simply a temporary thing and will shut us out of eternal life if we allow it. The life is more than meat. And the body is more than raiment, verse 23. And 24, consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? You don't need to worry about your physical needs. When you're in the service of God, God will care for you. I have tried him. I have experienced God's protection over and over a year, over and over again. I have been in the ministry for 40 years. And in all of those years, I have seen time and time and time again when God has provided. In the midst of COVID-19 this year, when we were forbidden to travel, we were not issued travel passes. To, to even leave our, our home and our property for months. We had people coming to us, bringing food to us and, and selling it. Neighbors that couldn't travel to sell their produce. The uh, farmers were prohibited from selling their produce in the market. The market was closed. And they were wondering, what shall I do? And, and they came to us bringing their produce. And we had an abundance. We had all kinds of, of fruits and vegetables in abundance. When those in the cities, in some cases, were hungry. Or they, they were living on, on just rice that the government came and, and passed out finally. And... And we were, we were living in abundance because God had his eye over us. We were servants of the living God and God provided. And, and I have, from the time I was a child, my father was also a minister. And I remember when we, I remember when we were hungry or we were, I should say, not hungry. We were fearful of being hungry. The time came when the money ran out and we had no food. And we knelt in worship that evening. And we told God, God, our cupboard is now bare. We have eaten the last of our food. Please provide. And when we finished our worship that evening, there was a knock on the door and someone brought us a 10 kilo bag of beans and a 10 kilo bag of corn. And we lived on that until God provided more food for us. And I have never been, been wanting, never been hungry, though many times I've been brought to the point where if God did not provide, then we would go hungry. But God has never forsaken us, never left us. There were times when I had to leave the church of my fathers, the church that I had grown up in and had no support. And God provided. And um, times when I was working as an independent minister, and dependent on the gifts of, of supporters. And at times, at times it would fail, seem to fail. And then when 
when we became um, when we came close to being in need and we lifted up our voice in prayer, God would provide at the very time that we needed it. I have tried his promises and I know they're true. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Ministers above everyone else need to know in whom they trust. They need to have implicit confidence in God. The next point I would like us to take note of, revealing the qualities that are required in a worker for God is consecration. We see this consecration in the life of Christ. In Luke 2, 48, we read, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us behold thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing Jesus from childhood his the whole keynote of his ministry is summed up in the next verse this this statement that he made to his mother in reply to her question son why hast thou thus dealt with us Verse 49, and he said unto them, how is it that she sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And fellow workers, this should be the keynote of our ministry. Are we about our father's business? Are you about your father's business? Or are you serving yourself? Are you serving men? Are you doing what people think is your duty? Or are you doing what you know to be the duty God has laid in your heart? Are we consecrated to God's service? In Genesis 12, we read of, of Abraham's call. Starting in verse 1, we read, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. God did not tell him where that land would be. God did not tell him how far away it was. God did not tell him if it was fertile, if it would be good for crops and herds. God did not tell him if he would be able to make a living there. God did not tell him how far away it was or which direction. He just said, unto a land that I will show thee. And in verse 4, we read, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, 
And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So, so Abram did not hesitate to obey. He got up and he left at God's command. Not knowing where he was going. We read in Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. He didn't wait for God to explain to him why or where or what the purpose was. He simply obeyed God. And as gospel workers, there will be times when we will not be able to explain to anyone else why we're doing something, why we're going to that remote place over there, or why we are, are behaving the way we're behaving, or eating the way that we're eating. Because we are simply obeying the convictions of the Holy Spirit rather than, than questioning at every point, why are we doing this, God? Why do you want me to go there or to do this? In Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, we read of Matthew's call. It says, and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Matthew did not question, how much are you going to pay me? Will I have enough to keep my standard of living? Will I have enough for my family? There were none of that kind of question. If, God, if Christ was calling him, that was sufficient for him. Fellow workers, is your heart in the work? Are you serving Christ because you can do no other? Because a woe is upon you if you do not obey. Or are you serving him merely for the money? Are you serving him because it's a job? We need to examine our own motives. Peter, James, John, and Andrew are another example of consecration. We read in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. These men had families, wives and children dependent on them. They, they had parents dependent upon them. And yet when, when Jesus said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. The record tells us that they, left their nets immediately and followed him. 
they trusted that God, they, they were not acting presumptuously. They were trusting that the God who called them into service would provide for their needs. Christ, on one occasion, he, he asked Peter to borrow his boat to, to allow him to push out a little ways from shore. And this is what he did. He pushed out a little from shore, sat in the boat, and taught the immense crowds of thousands of people that had gathered on the shore to hear. After using Peter's boat, he asked Peter to cast his net into the sea. And Peter had toiled all night the night before and had caught nothing. And Peter was tempted to, to say, well, well, we, we haven't caught anything. It's, it's not going to do any good to fish now in the daytime. But Peter didn't do that because Jesus said to cast the net, he cast the net. And he cast it on the side that Jesus told him to cast it on. And there was a huge catch of fish. And Peter had the evidence that Christ would pay him, that his labors would be abundantly paid. And and Peter had the, um, the evidence that he needed that his family would not go hungry. And I believe Christ will give just the evidence that we need, each one of us, that we will not go hungry, that God will provide if we are willing to be used by God, if we are willing to enter into the service of God. The Apostle Paul is another one that stands out in sharp contrast to the selfish, um, world-loving individual. When Christ told Paul, I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles, Paul did not hesitate. Paul, in Paul's life, we see we see an example of one who was willing to suffer. One, he tells later on, he tells of how he had suffered shipwreck three times, how he had been beaten and stoned and, and um, hunted by his man. And, and um, Paul's life was not a, a happy one in terms of of ease and comfort. Paul was constantly on the move. He had no certain dwelling place, no pillow to lay his head upon, always on the move. But Paul never looked back. Paul had consecrated his life to the master. When on the road to Emmaus, his course was arrested and he realized that he was persecuting the son of God. He made a consecration of himself to God and he never looked back. In first Timothy chapter three, verse eight, we read a verse that we've read previously where we noticed the point that God's servants would not be greedy of filthy lucre. But I want us to notice something else in this passage this time. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued. God's servants, God's workers will not be double-tongued. To be double-tongued 
is to be is to say one thing at one time and something else at another time to say to certain people certain truths certain things and and then hide those things that we've we've said to others it's to speak pleasing words to speak things that please the listener and if you have listeners with one um, cherished sin you close your mouth and you don't mention that to that person but to someone else who has a different cherished sin you'll mention the ones that he's not guilty of and then he feels better than others and he feels like you're patting him on the back to be double-tongued is to speak out of we say in modern English speak out of both sides of your mouth is something to one person and something else to someone else you speak what what either the listener wants to hear or what you want to say and use the word of God deceitfully as we have, have noticed before in in councils on health 322 we read that the worker will live and will advocate health reform it says of all men in the world the physician and the minister should have strictly temperate habits the welfare of society demands total abstinence of them for their influence is constantly telling for or against moral reform and the improvement of society it is willful sin in them to be ignorant of the laws of health did you did you catch that let me pause there for a moment it is willful sin in them to be ignorant of the laws of health or indifferent to them let me pause there so if we as workers do not study physiology, if we do not study the health message and, and become knowledgeable about how to stay healthy and practice that, then, then it tells us that it is willful sin. I can't tell you how many people, how many ministers I have heard say, oh, health doesn't have anything to do with the gospel. Our message is not what we eat and, and how we live. That's not our message. Our message is just Bible. But this seems to just tell us something different. You see, brothers and sisters, fellow workers, that natural law the laws of nature are just as much the laws of god as is the moral law the ten commandments the law that governs our physical being the laws of physiology were created by the same god that said thou shalt not kill and so and so we are lawbreakers if we violate the principles of health. And just as we are responsible to God to study, to know the moral law, we are also responsible to God to study and know physical or physiological law the laws of nature how to keep our bodies in health because our bodies we're told is the temple of the living god god the only way god can speak to you in your mind is through that brain made of flesh and blood 
our our minds operate in the physical realm they operate in a realm that um that it's it's well-being is determined by our obedience to the laws of health if you eat a great amount of of fried food fatty food your bloodstream will be clogged and your the small capillaries in your brain will not be receiving the oxygen and the nutrients that they need and you will have a foggy brain and not be able to think clearly if if you're eating highly spiced foods with msg or other excitotoxins then the nerves in your brain are going to be overexcited and you will not be thinking clearly if um, if you're eating a diet that is is conducive to to high blood pressure or high blood sugar or any of these other diseases that will will hinder the body's living machinery then then we are hindering our ability for service and so reading on so it's called willful sin reading on it says for they are looked up to as wise above other men this is especially true of the physician who is entrusted with human life he is expected to indulge in no habit that will weaken life though life forces and it has been clearly presented to me that God's people are to take a firm stand against meat eating. Would God for 30 years give his people the message that if they desire to have pure blood and clear minds, they must give up the use of flesh meat if he did not want them to heed this message? by the use of flesh meat the animal nature is strengthened and the spiritual nature is weakened such men as you and, and she was writing to a minister such men as you who are engaged in the most solemn and important work ever entrusted to human beings need to give special heed to what they eat fellow ministers and workers, gospel workers. We need to set a right example to our flock. And God has been giving us the health message for far more than 30 years now. God has been giving this health message for 160 years to the Advent people. Are we not ready to practice it are we not following it god has been telling us as a people to give up flesh meat since 1863 and and following are we willing to obey i have sat in meetings in the mainstream here in philippines and heard messages that were making a raid, a, a war, waging war against health reformers. I visited a church one Sabbath. It was my first time to visit this church. And I usually um, do not attend the mainstream Adventist church. I have been meeting in home churches and separate churches for um, for 40 years now almost for 35 years I should say and but but when I am in a new place or have opportunity to visit and to reach out to souls then then I do so as the Lord impresses me and I attended this mainstream Adventist church one day 
and um, and the minister's sermon was an attack upon what he called extremists and fanatics that are vegetarian and and then after after making an attack verbal attack against vegetarians then he made an attack upon those that even give up fish the reality is fish have a face they have eyes and a mouth fish are just as much flesh or meat as is any other animal and when god speaks about being a vegetarian he means to give up everything that has a face whether it's a fish or a sheep or a chicken or a cow whatever it is any dead carcasses and um, god does not want us to kill another living creature to feed on its carcass and and um and this man this minister of the gospel in the seventh day adventist church was attacking those fanatics he called them who give up flesh and even give up fish in in his eyes this was a terrible thing and but we are told here that god would not have been giving the health message if he didn't want the ministers and the people to practice it and we need to take a firm stand against meat eating it says <clears throat> reading on it says will any who are ministers of the gospel proclaiming the most solemn truth ever given to mortals set an example in returning to the flesh pots of Egypt will those who are supported by the tithe should be able to look up to their minister as an example of what God requires of them. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 4 and 5 we notice another qualification which I believe we need to give attention to. He is to be one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? He is to be one that ruleth well his own house. So he is to be someone who exercises the God-given authority of a parent, of a father, a head of a household. Because only as he knows how to and practices governing in his own home is he fit and able to govern in the church of God. And there are two extremes. And I want to point out one extreme first. There was a man in the Godhead movement that was being funded by a private independent ministry. He was from Papua New Guinea. That's an island off the north coast of Australia and half of the island um, is 
makes up part of Indonesia, and half of the island is a separate nation called Papua New Guinea. And and this this minister one day it was found out that he viewed his wife as property instead of as as someone who is to stand by his side as an equal and and what this man did is an appalling crime that should have put him in prison one day one one evening he called his brother to come to his house and his brother held his own wife held his wife and he proceeded to beat her with a two by four piece of lumber and he beat her periodically through the night in anger that she was being rebellious she barely left alive got away the next day and her father was able to to rescue her and this was a gospel minister and brothers and sisters god has given no authority to to exercise this kind of authority but that's one extreme but another extreme is that men will be like eli God charged Eli with honoring his sons above the Lord. Eli had permitted the offering appointed by God as a blessing to Israel to be made a thing of abhorrence rather than bring his sons to shame for their impious and abominable practices. Those who follow in their own inclination in blind affection for their children indulging them in the gratification of their selfish desires and do not bring to bear the authority of God to rebuke sin and correct evil, make it manifest that they are honoring their wicked children more than they honor God. They are more anxious to shield their reputation than to glorify God more desirous to please their children than to please the Lord and to keep his service from every appearance of evil. Eli um, Just a moment here, sorry. Eli had made a serious mistake in not training his children from their childhood, not curbing their desires, but giving them whatever they wanted. And when they grew up, they expected that they should still have whatever they wanted 
And so when people would bring their offerings to God, they would take portions that did not pertain to them. They would take whatever portion they desired at whatever time they desired forcefully. They, they stoop to even lower crimes. And, and the Bible says they even lay with the women that came to the worship of God. And, and these men had been indulged in by Eli as an indulgent parent. And his lack of faithfulness in exercising parental authority entered into his church and national responsibilities and he failed to exercise his judicial and pastoral or priestly authority. God held Eli as a priest and a judge of Israel accountable for the moral and religious standing of his people, and in a special sense for the character of his sons. He should first have attempted to restrain evil by mild measures, but if these did not avail, he should have subdued the wrong by the severest means. He incurred the Lord's displeasure by not reproving sin and executing justice upon the sinner. He could not be depended upon to keep Israel pure. Those who have too little courage to reprove wrong or who through indolence or lack of interest make no earnest effort to purify the family or the church of God are held accountable for the evil that may result from their neglect of duty. We are just as responsible for evils that we might have checked in others by exercise of parental or pastoral authority as if the acts had been our own. I want us to consider very carefully what this statement says. This statement, first of all, brings out the fact that we are to have courage to reprove wrong. The, the case of the Aaron, the priest, Moses' brother, comes to my mind when I think of this statement. Aaron had too little courage to reprove wrong when Moses was in the mount receiving instruction from God. And the people came to Aaron and said, make us gods that will go before us. And Aaron had them bring him gold and he he made a golden calf for the people to worship. Instead of standing up nobly and reproving the people and rebuking them, they ended up going deeper into idolatry than they had even dreamed of themselves. Aaron had too little courage to reprove wrong. They Later, when Moses came down the mount, Moses was angry. The record tells us that his anger waxed hot. Moses manifested a righteous indignation, and he cast the tables of stone to the ground, breaking them. And he took the calf and threw it in the fire and, and melted it down and ground it into powder and put it in the, cast it into the river for them to drink. Moses was a man that could be trusted to keep Israel pure. He was a man that
that was willing to stand for the right, though the heavens fall. But Aaron was a time server. Aaron would do whatever pleased the people. This tells us, fellow workers, that we are just as responsible for evils that we might have checked in others by exercise of parental or pastoral authority as if the acts had been our own. Let me bring this a little closer to home. I know an elder when I was pastoring in Los Angeles. This elder had a TV in his own home, a television, and they would watch whatever the programmers wanted to put on that television. Violence, sex, immorality, spiritualism, all of those things. And when you think about it, these acts of these criminal immoral acts are being brought right into our homes through the television. And perhaps we don't watch them ourselves, but our children watch them. We are responsible for, for bringing into our homes these evil, immoral, criminal things that are displayed on the television. When we sit there and watch violent crimes being performed in front of us, God says, I will set no evil thing before mine eyes. God has told us that that should be our motto. And, and yet, people are, are setting before them the things on the television. And, and we have a certain parental authority that we are to exercise in our own homes. We are to keep our children from association with evildoers, with evil associates, people that are um, with young associates that are, are intemperate, that are doing drugs or, or drinking or, or just um, being self-indulgent just playing and, and doing nothing useful, not learning to that their time belongs to God. We are responsible to check those evils in our homes. And we are responsible as pastors um, for our flocks. And it says that if we fail to exercise that authority, then we become responsible for those acts as if we had done them. Aaron, the priest, was responsible for the idolatry that Israel um, went into because he condoned it. He did not reprove it and stop it. Eli did not manage his household according to God's rules for family government. He followed his own judgment. The father overlooked the faults and sins of his sons in their childhood, flattering himself that after a time they would outgrow their evil tendencies. Many are now making a similar mistake. They think they know a better way of training their children than that which God has given in his word. They foster wrong tendencies in them, urging as an excuse, they are too young to be punished. Wait till they become older and can be reasoned with. 
Thus, wrong habits are left to strengthen until they become second nature. The children grow up without restraint, with traits of character that are a lifelong curse to them and are liable to be reproduced in others. Ellen White describes being on the trains or, or the cars and, and watching little children have temper tantrums, we could call it, where they, they just throw their arms about, throw themselves on the floor, stomp their feet, or, or just manifest passion and anger. And, and, and to stop their noise and their commotion, the parent will give them whatever they desire. Maybe they just want something to eat and it's not time. And so the parent says no, and then they throw a temper tantrum to get their way. And then the parent gives in or they keep crying and fussing until they get what they want. And in this way, those evil habits are, in, are strengthened in the child instead of repressed. And, um, and thus we are, are molding our little ones lifelong. We are, are um, just like a tree. If you don't train it while it's young, when it gets old, it's, it's too already impossible to, to bend it, to train it anymore. And, and that's the case with, with our children. And so God's servants need to be setting the example in their own homes of the exercise of parental authority. And they need to be willing to do the hard things in the church to exercise pastoral authority. When someone needs to be disciplined and put out of the church, they need to have the strength to do that. We were in a committee meeting one time and and there was um, there was a nomination for for me to be the secretary of the conference, and and when when there's a a um, a hand raised before before it went to vote, someone objected to my being on the nomination. And so the nominating committee went back into, into deliberation and the, the, um, the, the leaders from the general conference came into the, into the nominating committee and said, well, what's wrong brother? And, and these people had no, good reason for objecting. What they really were objecting is because I was preaching and teaching that the elders need to get TVs out of their homes, that they need to enforce the law of God in their homes, that their children need to be properly trained and disciplined. And this infuriated them. It made them angry. And that's the reason they didn't want me to have any office and I didn't care if I had an office or not, but um, what happened was that when these people objected, the, they could not give any reasons to why they objected to my being selected. And, and the general conference individual um, said, well, you have, you don't have any, any good reasons. So, so let's keep him on. And, and then they said, we will break away from the conference. Our church will leave the conference if you don't take him off. And he said, oh, 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 brother, don't do that. Don't do that. And, and we can, we can settle this. And then he insisted that they remove my name only out of fear of division only because there was a threat instead of having 
um, justification. Here is a man that refused to exercise his pastoral authority and put and stand for what was right, to stand for principle. And, and so um, this is just one example of how often in the Church of God, pastoral authority is not, is not upheld. It's not exercised. When people living in open sin um, should be dealt with and put out of the church, they don't have a backbone. And they cannot stand up and, and say, this man should be put out of the church. There are many qualifications, fellow workers, that we need to be aware of. The, the worker for God perhaps um, has, uh, is required to have higher qualifications than perhaps any other, any other work because he is standing as a representative, as an ambassador for the king of the universe. And if we are not qualified or if we are not fitted and educated for service, then we do not belong in the work of God. And we're going to be talking later on about, about how to, to be fitted for the work and, and what kind of education we need for the work. And... Um, but I want to leave you with these qualifications that we talked about today um, to realize that, that these are character qualities mostly that we've talked about. It's, it's um, positions that we need to be willing to take and and integrity and, and these other things. These are our character qualities. And those are not things that can so easily be, be obtained later on in life, simply through regular education. And, and if we don't have these qualities, we need to step down until we do have these qualities. And and those that are have the work of selecting men for the ministry for the gospel work need to understand god's calling and god's requirements for his chosen ambassadors we stand as a mouthpiece for god we stand between the living and the dead and souls will be lost or saved by, by the course that we take as ministers and gospel workers. So brethren, I pray that you will take seriously the things that we have, have been discussing and take them to heart. And this is my prayer. And I invite you to, I invite you to kneel with me where possible as we close our service with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the precious words of life that you've given to us, the words of instruction as to how we can be fitted um, or how we can have a, I should say, a qualified ministry, um, gospel workers that are truly um, what you want them to be. And I pray that if we do not meet those qualifications, that we will do everything in our power to obtain those qualifications, that, we'll seek, that we will seek you earnestly until we are properly fitted for service. 
before we attempt to stand before the people as leaders. Forgive us where we have failed and we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.